Hello, um, I'm Dr. Gigi Abate. I'm an endocrinologist at the Mayo Clinic in Jacksonville, Florida. Uh, my clinical and research interests include metabolic bone disease um, and calcium and parathyroid disorders. I've been practicing endocrinology with emphasis in parathyroid disorders and bone disorders for about 10 years as part of a multidisciplinary team that treats patients with parathyroid disease. Um, and I treat patients who have been diagnosed with parathyroid disorders coming for a second opinion. Uh, those patients coming in with uh, symptoms that cannot be explained and seeking solutions for their symptoms. In addition to patients referred to us with um, high elevated calcium for further workup. My name is John Kastler. I'm a head and neck surgeon here at Mayo Clinic in Florida. My practice is almost exclusively uh, involved in the treatment of tumors in the head and neck area. About a half of my practice is related to treatment of endocrine tumors in the head and neck area, specifically thyroid and parathyroid disorders. I've been practicing for about 30 years. I've seen a lot of changes in head and neck surgery. We've tried to incorporate those changes into our practice here, specifically as they relate to treatment of thyroid and parathyroid disorders. So to start off, uh, we just we both want to mention to you that we're speaking to you without masks because we're in the safety of our offices, uh, closed doors, uh, social distancing during COVID era. Today we'll be discussing with you about parathyroid glands, how they affect us. Gigi, can you tell us a little bit about the parathyroid glands? What are they? What do they do? Sure. Uh, to start off, parathyroid glands are four little glands located behind the thyroid gland. So we all know the thyroid gland is located on the front part of our neck, right over the trachea. It's a small little butterfly-shaped gland um, behind the thyroid gland, and it works completely different from the thyroid gland. There are four little glands called parathyroid glands. They're the size of rice grain, a very small. And their function is to regulate calcium in the body. Calcium is a very important hormone that is important for brain function, for muscle function, and for bone strength. Um, therefore, I call these parathyroid glands sort of a thermostat for calcium regulation. So if you have too much calcium in the blood, um, which is not a good thing to have, then their job is to make sure that that calcium is excreted through the kidneys um, and, uh, and some of it is reabsorbed back into the bone so we don't have too much calcium in the blood. If you have too little of calcium, then they send out a signal called parathyroid hormone. And in turn, this PTH, uh, also called parathyroid hormone, goes to the bone and gets calcium out of the bone and also helps us to reabsorb calcium from the gut and allows us to absorb calcium from the kidney so that overall the calcium in the body is gonna be um, at adequate level for our body to function. Um, most people, like I mentioned, have four glands. Um, however, some individuals have a fifth one and it could be located anywhere in the upper part of the neck um, or it could be somewhere in the chest. Now, when the thermostat is functioning properly, the calcium is appropriate in the blood. The problem comes whenever there is a dysregulation in the thermostat or the parathyroid glands are not working properly. So, John, tell us about what causes these parathyroid glands to malfunction um, and uh, what are some of these tumors that we're looking at? Well, um, Gigi, there, there basically are two categories of tumor. Tumor is, means, just means mass. Uh, the first category is something called a neoplasm. A neoplasm is an abnormal new growth of cells in a parathyroid gland. Now, these neoplasms can be either benign or malignant. Fortunately, 99% of parathyroid neoplasms are benign. And benign parathyroid neoplasms are called adenomas. In patients that have primary hyperparathyroidism, about 85 to 90% of patients will only have a single adenoma or a single benign tumor. In five to 10% of cases, there could be multiple adenomas. Now malignant parathyroid tumors are very rare. They represent less than 1% of all parathyroid tumors. And what's interesting, their, their initial presentation is often quite different than normal benign parathyroid adenomas. The parathyroid hormone level is often very high. Interoperatively, you can see more invasive qualities to the tumor. So you can 
oftentimes get clues both preoperatively and intraoperatively that a parathyroid tumor or neoplasm could be malignant. In both cases, though, benign or malignant parathyroid tumors, there is excessive production or excess secretion of parathyroid hormone. Now, the second group of, of tumors is called hyperplasia. This usually involves multiple glands. In hyperplasia, there's an abnormal diffuse enlargement of the gland. But once again, this is associated with excess production of parathyroid hormone. So Gigi, in a patient with primary hyperparathyroidism, what kind of abnormalities would we expect to see on their blood work? It's a good question, John. So the majority of patients we see um, have no symptoms and high calcium is picked up because their primary care physician runs a comprehensive metabolic panel or renal profile. And on the blood test, they note that there's an elevated calcium level. Typically, those are repeated and confirmed to be elevated. So the next thing we look at is if the calcium in the blood is high, what is your parathyroid hormone doing as it's the master regulator? And what we see is either the parathyroid hormone is elevated or in some cases it could be just high normal range, um, which would be inappropriate for someone who has an elevated blood calcium level. Sometimes we see high calcium in the urine um, as well. Uh, so those are the typical findings of uh, hyperparathyroidism. And John, once someone shows these laboratory abnormalities, what are some of the diagnostic imagings that um, we proceed with? Well, Gigi, this can be this can be quite challenging. These can be very tricky, uh, and, and the type of imaging that is used, or the type of radiologic study that's used, can vary from institution to institution. If I had one radiologic technique to pick to identify abnormal parathyroid glands here at Mayo Clinic in Florida, it would be an ultrasound. Ultrasounds have a very high rate of detection. It also has the advantage of being relatively inexpensive and it does not involve radiation exposure to the patient. There are some limitations of ultrasound, however. It usually doesn't pick up tumors that are located deep in the neck or ones that are hiding behind bony structures like the collarbones, clavicles, or the sternum or breastbone. So when they're behind bone, ultrasound doesn't pick them up and we have to look at something else. There are other techniques that are commonly used one of these are nuclear medicine scanning techniques. These are called parathyroid scans or sestimedi scans. They can be combined with CT scanning to improve detection. So these two imaging techniques, the sestimedi or parathyroid scan and the ultrasound are the ones most commonly used to detect parathyroid tumors. Sometimes we're not able to pick up the parathyroid tumor with, with either the ultrasound or the nuclear medicine studies. When that's the case, we have to um, rely on more sophisticated techniques of imaging. For example, we use something called a 4D CT scan, which times the injection of contrast material in such a way to take advantage of the, uh, of the imaging characteristics of parathyroid tumors. We sometimes we use MRIs, um, there is a new technique that's on the horizon using PET scanning images to try to detect these tumors that aren't detected by normal means. These involve use of new radiologic materials or radioactive materials to try to help visualize these tricky tumors. So Gigi, what kind of symptoms do you see in patients that have primary hyperparathyroidism? Well, John, that's a very um, important question. So what we see is the majority of patients have no symptoms at all. Like I said, it's picked up because they go in for blood work. However, there's some vague symptoms to, the symptoms can reach from minor mild symptoms to major symptoms. So either someone has no symptoms that's picked up by blood work, or they could have symptoms like, you know, depression, fatigue, um, bone pain, they just don't feel well. Um, and they can go from doctor to doctor without really getting a diagnosis. And, and all they have is an elevated calcium, maybe that's been overlooked. So that is more of a, um, you know, the, 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 uh, the 
one of the symptoms to the point of someone can have major symptoms where they have kidney stones uh, because they've lost calcium from the bone they can develop uh, osteoporosis and that can lead to fractures um, and their blood calcium can be so high that they can require hospitalization and they could be um, you know, dehydrated, can have kidney injury. So the symptoms can range, um, there's a wide range of ways of presenting with um, primary hepaparathyroidism, but the most common symptom is just patients do not have any symptoms. And John, um, when we, you know, once these, we're diagnosed hepaparathyroidism and we do imaging and either we find the tumor, the enlarged gland or not, what are some of the treatment options we currently have for this uh, disease? Well, Gigi, uh, surgery is, is considered the definitive treatment for mm -hmm. primary hyperparathyroidism. So removing the abnormal gland or glands should get rid of the, the problem. Now, surgery though, regardless of its type, whether you're doing a heart transplant or whether you're doing a mole removal, has risk to it. So mm -hmm. all surgery has risk of bleeding, infection, and risk from anesthesia. There are some risks that are peculiar to parathyroid surgery as well. So in any case, we wanna make sure that we're doing surgery for the right reasons and that the risks of surgery are clearly outweighed by the benefits of doing it. So if a patient has symptoms that we can reasonably attribute to hyperparathyroidism, surgery is, is generally a good option. One situation where that's Clearly the case is the patient that has kidney stones. In patients that have kidney stones or renal stones um, and evidence of hyperparathyroidism, those patients will usually benefit from having surgery done. There are some situations, however, where a patient, as you've mentioned, may not have any symptoms related to the hyperparathyroidism, but they would still benefit from having surgery done. And there are several situations where that's, that's the case. Those are called indications. So there have been conferences where consensus statements have been formed to list the indications where parathyroid surgery may be indicated, even though there are no symptoms. Those would include, number one, having a serum calcium level that is a full point or one milligram per deciliter that is above the upper limit of normal. That's the first indication, or that's a, an indication. Second indication, the second group of indications would be skeletal, meaning if you have osteoporosis at any site and you have hyperparathyroidism, you would benefit from having the surgery done. If you have asymptomatic vertebral fractures, you would benefit from surgery. As we've mentioned, there, there are some kidney-related issues that would justify or warrant having surgery done. If you have decreased urine function and hyperparathyroidism, surgery should be considered. If you have excess urine excretion of calcium, meaning more than 400 milligrams in a 24 hour period, you would benefit from having the surgery. And as we mentioned previously, if you have kidney stones and hyperparathyroidism, you'd benefit from having the surgery. The last indication is age. Patients that are less than 50 years of age and have documented hyperparathyroidism would benefit from having surgery done because this is a progressive disease. It generally gets worse over time. And patients that are under 50 years of age will have a long time for this condition to cause lots of problems. So those are the, those are the reasons why we would consider uh, doing parathyroid surgery. Now, while we're on the topic of, of surgery, let me just briefly describe what's involved in the surgery. So first of all, surgery to take care of parathyroid tumors is called a parathyroidectomy. It's generally performed under general anesthesia, meaning the patient goes completely to sleep with this. On occasion though, we will do the operation under local anesthesia. So you make a small incision in the lower part of the neck in the middle, kind of where my necktie is. We dissect down to where we think the tumor might be based on our preoperative localization studies. If we find a tumor in that location, we take it out and send it to the lab. If we don't find a tumor in that location, we need to investigate other areas where the tumor could be located. Some surgeons advocate exploring all the parathyroid glands in all cases. This is controversial and is kind of beyond the scope of our discussion today. 
if gentle anesthesia is used, a nerve monitoring breathing tube is used to monitor vocal cord nerve function during the surgery, since the vocal cord nerves are located in pro close proximity to the parathyroid glands. In addition to testing the abnormal parathyroid gland in the lab, we also will oftentimes or usually check the patient's parathyroid hormone levels during the surgery. So removal of the parathyroid tumor should result in a significant drop in the patient's parathyroid hormone level. If the level doesn't drop sufficiently, we have to suspect that there might be an additional tumor around and we need to try to investigate that and find it. After we have successfully completed the removal of the abnormal parathyroid tissue, we close the wound, we wake the patient up and take them to the recovery room. After a couple of hours of observation in the recovery room, most patients are able to leave the hospital. So Gigi, are there a patient that may not be a good surgical candidate or doesn't want surgery, are there any alternatives for managing or treating hyperparathyroidism? Sure, that's a good question. And of course, as you mentioned that the number one treatment for this disease is to go for cure, which is surgery. However, in some cases where patients either don't want to have surgery or the, you know, their calcium is high, parathyroid hormone is high, and they're not surgical candidates for whatever reason, either they're too sick to have surgery um, or they're on certain medications that uh, you know, preclude them from having surgery. In that case, um, there is a medication. Um, it is uh, something called Sensipar. It's been out for many years. Um, and this medication is sort of a Band-Aid. Uh, what it does is it lowers the calcium, it lowers the parathyroid hormone, and prevents complications that comes from having those two high levels. But this would be something uh, that a person would have to take mostly for the rest of their lives. It has its own side effects, but it, medication is an option, although it is a second line treatment. Another thing I see often is, uh, as you mentioned, John, that there are indications, there are definitive indications for surgery per the guidelines. And those are if somebody has high calcium above one limit, upper, uh, the upper limit of normal for calcium, if they have kidney stones, osteoporosis. However, how about in those individuals who have just mild calcium elevation of 10.5, 10.6, parathyroid hormone is fine, and their bone density looks normal. And in that case, you know, surgery is an option. However, if they don't want to have surgery, we know from several studies that individuals uh, with milder disease can be observed for many, many years without having developing any complications from that, which complications such as a rise in the calcium at a dangerous level or developing kidney stones or developing osteoporosis. So in those patients with milder cases and choose not to have surgery for whatever the reason, then um, observation would be an excellent option. And that would include um, obtaining a blood calcium level every six months um, and getting a 24-hour urine collection uh, you know, once or every, every year, every two years, uh, make sure they're not developing kidney stones and make sure that they're getting bone density to check on the status of the bone every, uh, every two years, every one to two years, depending on where they are on that bone density measurement. So these are the non-surgical treatment it goes from observation to uh, medic medical therapy that uh, we offer patients. Um, and, you know, we see patients with um, other things that can cause high calcium. So that's also something that we need to talk about and exclude as well before we go with surgery, as you know, John, that um, not everybody who has high calcium has hyperparathyroidism. So that's one of the things we always consider also before we go for surgery. We, so we do a comprehensive evaluation before we diagnose somebody with a primary hyperparathyroidism, which implies that there's an enlargement or a tumor on the parathyroid gland. So we spend a lot of time making those evaluations and making those determinations. And once the decision is made that you've got primary hyperparathyroidism, then um, it's up to the patient and their uh, physician to make that decision as to surgery is the better option or if observation or surgical treat, uh, um, non-surgical medications such as Sensipar would be the best option. That's a very good point, Gigi. 
Uh, there are a lot of causes for high calcium and not, not all high calcium is hyperparathyroidism. There are some conditions that can mimic hyperparathyroidism. For example, there are some kidney abnormalities that can mimic hyperparathyroidism. And we certainly don't want to be doing an operation in the neck when the patient has a kidney problem. So um, one of the things that I enjoy uh, working here is that I get to collaborate with endocrinologists like yourself so that if there are any questions, we can work through the subtleties of a clinical presentation to make sure that we're always doing the right thing for the patient, uh, given their individual circumstances. And to add on to that, you know, one of the things also I see is rare things. You know, one of the advantages of working in a collaborative uh, tertiary care center is not everybody who comes with hyperparathyroid symptoms or parathyroid uh, something that looks like hyperparathyroidism only has hyperparathyroidism. So there are other syndromes that go along with primary hyperparathyroidism. So we always keep our um, minds open um, when we see individuals um, outside of surgery. We always try to ask for a family history and we ask for other, look at the whole general picture of the patient to determine that is it really a one-time disease we're looking at um, or is there a syndrome or is it a genetic condition and we have an excellent geneticist once, uh, you know, if there's a question like that arise, things like multiple endocrine neoplasia, et cetera. So, um, I, you know, that's one of the things I enjoy about working in multidisciplinary system in a tertiary care center is that it's not always just treating what we see in front of us. We always go in depth and look at, could there be some other conditions that could be presenting with parathyroid disorder, but it could be more serious or something else we need to be looking for in that individual. So I think we do a comprehensive assessment in endocrinology. And um, and then one thing I wanted to ask you, John, is secondary, you know, someone who has surgery somewhere else or here, and they would have a failed surgery, meaning their parathyroid hormones still elevated after surgery. Um, and in that case, one of the things we do in endocrine is we reevaluate again and we say, is it because, you know, they're not getting enough calcium now um, or was there some other diagnoses we should be worried about or is there tumor somewhere else in the body? What are your thoughts on that once when you see patients like that? Well, you raise a very good point. Um, fortunately, the cure rate for hyperparathyroidism is quite high with parathyroid mm -hmm. But for whatever reason, we do come across patients that, that surgery has failed to cure. Uh, in that case, I think the best thing to do is to take a step back. Number one, confirm that they really do have hyperparathyroidism. So confirm the, the, the diagnosis in recurrent or persistent hyperparathyroidism is essential. Secondly, from my standpoint, I want to get the records from the prior surgical procedure. I want to see where the surgeon has been, what was removed. I want to be able to correlate that with the final pathology to make sure that parathyroid tissue was removed. Was it a malignancy? Uh, was, it, was it benign parathyroid tissue? Then we need to do a, a thorough search to try to see where the remaining problem might be. And that's oftentimes when we get into some of the more sophisticated imaging techniques. But you want to do your homework on this. You want to make sure that when you go to the operating room, you really have a very good idea of where the tumor is, particularly in these recurrent cases, because you'll have to be dealing with scar tissue and things like that. And anytime you're doing business surgery, the risks are generally higher. And John, so what should patients be looking for in a surgeon? Um, once they do get the diagnosis of primary hyperthyroidism, uh, I mean, I, I know that the most important thing is a good surgeon, right, to, to cure this disease. Um, so what are some of the things that they should be looking for and they should be asking? Well, I think it's important. It's like anything uh, that we do in life. The more you do something, the better you get at it. So with, with thyroid and parathyroid surgery, the more of these procedures that a surgeon performs, the better they tend to get at it. So I think it's very appropriate to, for, for, for patients to ask the surgeon, how many of these do you perform a year? Uh, what kind of results do you have? Things like that. And patients shouldn't feel bashful about doing that. 
I think it's also important, JJ, uh, to, to be able to have a team of physicians around uh, the patient that are able to manage not just the surgical, but the medical issues related to this. Now, we, we haven't touched on this, but as, as you know, there are other forms of hyperparathyroidism. And some of those patients that have renal induced hyperparathyroidism or hyperparathyroidism related to the transplant oftentimes have many medical problems. So it's important that we have a team that, that gathers around that patient to make sure they have optimal results, not just during surgery, but in the post-operative course as well. Absolutely. Um, uh, you know, one of the things I see is calcium management afterwards. You know, you, you've been hearing on and all the time, don't take calcium, don't take calcium. And, um, you know, after surgery and all of a sudden, um, you have to take calcium. And so those, that's important that it has to be regulated. And as I mentioned previously, too, is, you know, looking back and saying, is this a one-time parathyroid disorder or is there something else that we should be considering? And then also other diseases, like you mentioned, John, is, you know, um, is there some other cause for high calcium? Um, one thing I didn't mention, I'm glad you brought that up, is there's something that mimics primary hyperparathyroidism, and it's called familial hypocalceric hypercalcemia. And what that means is that in certain individuals, it's more of a genetic problem, is uh, that their parathyroid gland senses only high level of calcium. And in that case, it's a benign condition. It's, it's their body. It's a, that's the only way you sense calcium. So that high calcium is normal. And what you see in these individuals is they've been told they've had high calcium since their 20s, you know, every time they get blood work done. And the way you make diagnosis is getting a 24-hour urine collection and getting to see how low the calcium is. So these are all important things that, are, uh, uh, that really need to be evaluated. Um, and then before we head to uh, before we head to surgery or treatment observation, so to me, I believe, and I think the initial workup is probably the most important thing. Um, and once you completely conclude that's the problem, then finding an excellent surgeon who does this um, on a regular basis who has very good experience, and I think that would set anybody up for success. And having a team, um, you know, to follow them before and after. Well, Gigi, it's been a pleasure chatting with you about hyperparathyroidism. It's something I think we both enjoy taking care of. So thank you for spending the time. Thank you to our audience too for, uh, for listening and, and please feel free to contact us if you have any questions. Well, thank you. I agree. Thank you so much.